Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast and video. Those of you watching on the video, um, I actually have not gotten out of my seat yet from about 30 seconds ago, finishing up a appearance on uh, the Varney show on Fox Business. And rather than uh, reconfigure and move and adjust, I'm just going to sit right here and start recording for you all. The um, uh, subject of this week's Dividend Cafe is... I, I hope it's uh, understandable. I hope I communicate it all clearly, um, both at DividendCafe.com and for you guys listening. The, the basic message isn't really all that profound, but the way in which I apply it, I'm hoping will, will really be useful to you. But I think that there are two facts that I'm going to state here, two beliefs, two tenets, two principles, if you will, that are both equally true that are both profoundly true, that are both significant, and that seem to be uh, at odds with one another, at least um, creating some internal tension between the two. The first is the basic idea that markets are highly dynamic forces, that they are constantly changing, that they are uh, ever unpredictable, that there are circumstances, conditions, and, and various um, things that impact the terrain of the economy and then the way that markets respond to that terrain and, and that creates you know, uh, chain reactions, that the, all of these processes are highly complex and highly unpredictable. And there's some that have studied this at great length. Um, my, there's a book by uh, Nassim Taleb called Fooled by Randomness that um, completely and totally uh, uh, informed and in a lot of ways uh, altered my beliefs about the complexity and unpredictability in what are, I believe, orderly and created systems that, can, that contain within them um, a significant amount of what appears to be chaos and, and in fact um, is, is not chaotic but is to uh, us mere mortals uh, impossible to, to predict and that we get into a lot of trouble when we start to project onto the unpredictable our own models and, and quantifiable systems of interpreting that which is itself quite complex and, and unpredictable. And, and these random forces of markets um, are not meant to be adjudicated that way. They, they are meant to be uh, part of the creative and, and, and uh, oftentimes chaotic, but um, certainly um, a, a exciting part of the human experience. And so you live with this kind of uncertainty and, and changing dynamism in, in economic conditions and in what we call markets, uh, obviously the context here being financial markets. And then the second tenet and fact and truth that I want to share is that there is nothing new under the sun. And I'm quoting this obviously from the great book of Ecclesiastes, um, but it's a, a, a principle and, a, and an expression that is often uttered in, in kind of cultural contexts. But basically, I don't believe we encounter things that we have not encountered before in some way, shape, form, or another. The, the um, other cliche that you could say kind of ties into this conversation is that notion of history not always repeating itself, but, but often rhyming. And, and so I think that there are a lot of different mistakes that people make, and, and particularly as it pertains to our desire to properly understand and make decisions through uh, financial markets and, and changing financial realities. The biggest mistake that I see from colleagues, from those who hold themselves out as professional financial advisors or members of the uh, professional investment community, is a total, complete disregard for history. Um, the the uh, a lack of interest in what history has to teach us. And the, the quote that has actually been um, something I've re-uttered many times throughout my adult life and something that had a big impact on me even at a younger age, it happened to be on the on the front book cover of a, uh, his, a series of history books that my parents had bought me when I was very young. 
but the quote from uh, the late President uh, John Kennedy was that a knowledge of the past prepares us for the crisis of the present and the challenge of the future. And I think right now, there's on just a daily basis, often in my inbox and in social media feeds and on the television, and, and, and overwhelmingly in, in the television and, and, and internet media, but also in our own conversations, there is a significant amount of anxiety around what we could call crises of the present, a sort of plural understanding of various things, whether it be the national debt levels, whether it be valuations in a lot of uh, uh, equity markets, whether it be the role of big tech in society, the relationship with China and their growing hegemonic power. Um, I could go on and on, um, but there are major categories of things that feel, and in many cases are, uh, present crises. And obviously the, the COVID moment was one um, that, that we now coming out of, but, but went through a year ago. The, the, the um, challenge of the future is blurred with the crisis of the present in a lot of ways. The analogy I use in Dividend Cafe today is uh, the Bay of Pigs was a present crisis when it was going on, and the Cold War was a future challenge, meaning that was sort of this generational kind of um, uncertain event that we were going through that had potential future, almost annihilationist kind of uh, paranoia af affiliated with it. And then in the here and now, there were various events that took place, such as Bay of Pigs, that resulted that 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 necessitated a present crisis. Um, the national debt's a great example of one that is often wrongly presented as a present crisis because it is in the present that the activities are taking place, the spending is taking place, the borrowing is taking place, and yet, really, if people think about it, whatever it is they're worried about is something that is. All, very likely a future event and a future event that apparently not very many people can time very well. You know, you think back to all the guys writing books in the 1970s and the 70s was just like an orgy of panic porn opportunists. The problem is back then, I actually think most of them meant it. Most of the, the panic industry now are just rank charlatans. Um, but the, it, it, back then, I think there are a lot of well-meaning people that were just wrong that were predicting the hyperinflation and predicting the death of the dollar and the death of the U.S. and the inevitable collapse of the American economy, the imminent collapse of the American economy um, around the debt explosion. And back then, our debt was like pizza money compared to now, you know. Um, now, they were right to be worried about debt, and we're right to be worried about debt. And the fact that it's gotten worse and the world hasn't fallen into a, a, a avalanche or a cave or a whatever it is not... Um, in, indicative of the fact that everything is rosy. It's just making the point that timing future challenges is hard to do and when those things come to a head. And therein lies part of the rub is you believe you're in a present crisis. It turns out not to have been a present crisis, yet it really is a future challenge and you kind of become apathetic. And I don't mean you or me, I mean societally and, and collectively and from a policy standpoint, it doesn't ever really get addressed because the present crisis didn't come to fruition and the fact that it lingers out there, well, it, it numbs us and it, and it um, uh, facilitates the delay. Well, I, I believe that the message I have today is simply this uh, desire for a rigorous understanding wherever a lesson can be found in the past to prepare both for present crises, but also to inform our ability to discern between present crises and future challenges. Um, I would love to see policymakers do that. I would love that to be part of the process by which these things actually get fixed. But I can't do much about that. And you can't do much about that. My context is in what I can do and must do and owe it to my clients to do as it pertains to the investment ramifications of these things. The idea of making investment decisions about some of the various catalysts to, to present concerns and future challenges that I've brought up without an informed understanding of the past is malpractice. I will tell you, and I, I'm kind of explicitly speaking to the large part of you that may not be clients of the Bonson Group. 
I believe the vast majority of financial professionals do not have um, a commitment to understanding uh, what history has to teach us and, and help us in preparing for these things. It's something I've observed professionally for over two decades. And the fact of the matter is that uh, one of the examples I, I use in Dividend Cafe, and there's a few other things I want to mention real quickly, um, I, I go back to the period of time from the middle of November of 2012 to the end of 2012 um, all the time because President Obama had been reelected, been reelected pretty, pretty easily and had full control of the Democrat Senate and all of the Bush tax cuts of the early 2000s were set to expire. And we were going to go into the second term of uh, Obama presidency um, and none of the uh, tax increases required any vote from anybody. The House didn't have to vote. The Senate didn't have to vote. They were all just going to happen. And uh, there were people, uh, there was wailing, gnashing, uh, uh, what are all the expressions, cats and dogs flying everywhere about capital gain taxes going higher. And so people were taking gains now to avoid taking gains later. They were moving monies to trusts. They were gifting to charities. They were... Uh, the, you look, the state tax was set to go up by a large amount and at a much lower threshold, it was going to pull in a lot more people and people were doing life insurance stuff and defective grant or trust and they were freezing assets and doing grats and eyelets and cruts and all of these different uh, alphabet soup of various estate planning mechanisms, which by the way, should just go to show you, there's a whole lot of estate planning mechanisms, which is one of the ironies of the whole thing. But my point being, they were accelerating decision-making, sometimes at the advice of well-meaning advisors, around something that they believed was going to happen and that did not happen. And in some cases, the opposite of it happened. The capital gain tax didn't get go higher and the lower rate did get made permanent and the state tax not only didn't go higher, it went lower. The state tax threshold went significantly higher, the threshold by which you would have to pay and the rate that you pay went way lower. It was the opposite of what everyone had planned on. And I don't agree with policymakers making people function within a one week, one month, two month window of time to try to figure it out. And I can sympathize with legal and tax and financial professionals like myself feeling that they owed it to clients to kind of prepare for the worst. But um, no, history is rather clear. It's, there, it's quite difficult to raise taxes. It's quite, the, the estate tax is not something that policymakers have traditionally really cared about a lot. They talk about it. They give speeches about it. They say how much it's awful for rich people to leave more money to their rich, already rich kids. But ultimately, moving the policy around has always been very different. And so I don't know what's going to happen with estate taxes and capital gain taxes. And I'm hearing all the speeches and all the proposals and all the things put forward. But the notion of not allowing history to inform me in how I plan on these things, for me to just assume all of the capital gain stuff being talked about is actually gonna happen with the clear and rather obvious precedent of history that to some degree, it's not. Now, uh, some of it maybe will. There will be likely a need for adjustment, but to have not learned from history, the need for patience and discernment, wisdom, um, I think is malpractice. And so that is a rather practical example that might connect a little more around one of the big, you know, kind of present crises as to this notion of a significant higher tax burden coming. Um, and all of which is still possible. But my point being the need to let these things play out, the hurt, the, the handicapping it, having to recognize the hurdles that has to be uh, overcome in, in a bipartisan form of government, in a Madisonian form of government that, that produces a separation of powers. Uh, these things are not quite so easy. And this, was, this is true in the Biden administration. It was true in the Trump administration. It was true in the Obama administration before that. President giving a speech saying, I'm going to do this, and people panicking about it, totally ignores that that's just not how it works. They can't just do it. Some of the bad stuff could happen and some of the good stuff may not happen. But the point being, there's a historical set of information that can help kind of drive the way we interpret these things in the present. I look also to a lot of the um, talk about the U.S. dollar. And there, this is one area 
where history has basically just put its arm around you and said, come, let me help you out with this. Because the idea of currency crisis, of, of, of lack of confidence in a, in a nation's sovereign well-being, uh, what happens when, when one nation grows its debt a lot, but a competitive nation grows its debt even more, of, of the impact of lower rates, of the impact of higher rates, of the impact of exchange rates, of the impact of trade levels. See, we just have this monumental amount of data and history and to go formulate a view on the dollar, on what we expect around inflation, deflation, on what we expect around interest rates, on what we expect about the future of economic supremacy or primacy out of the United States without learning what, what history has to teach us. I, I read people all the time, global macroeconomists, talking about what to expect from Europe in the future that have never studied what Europe was like pre-Euro, that don't understand 1994, let alone 1974. Um, I think that there is an entire set of information in the way that U.S. has dealt with various foreign policy crises, uh, the progression of developments as to how we've got to where we are with China, how China's got to where China is, and what to expect from them going forward. And none of this mitigates that we are not gonna know exactly how it plays out. And we're not gonna know all the pieces, but we're gonna have more information, more context, and, and a better sense of terrain that informs the way we navigate around the field, if you will. I probably am mixing like, like 20 metaphors at once, but that's, I don't care. Um, I think that we face plenty of crisis uh, as investors, meaning uncertainty, meaning challenges, meaning things that feel like they never happened before. Look, the United States government has never proposed $6 trillion of spending in four months before. Um, the, you know, the COVID pandemic, we, we passed three bills. All of these have already passed. So $2 trillion Families Act is not passed yet. $2 trillion infrastructure is not passed yet. But $2 trillion COVID of January, $1 trillion COVID of December, and $2 trillion COVID of CARES Act last March, that's $5 trillion that did pass. We've never done that before. New things happen. That does not contradict nothing new under the sun. Because what we know um, from the principle of nothing new under the sun is that there are realities. Uh, the analogy I use in Dividend Cafe, the Fed had never bought junk bond ETFs before. But the Fed, and they did last March and April in the COVID crisis, the, but there is an awful lot of precedent for the Fed having a sort of overarching view of their role that it is to salvage capital markets, that it is to lend and assist a helping hand to risk assets. So from my vantage point, wherever history has something to teach us, I want to try to learn it. And I can interpret it wrongly, and I could even have the facts wrong, let alone the way in which I interpret the facts. But that has to be the effort. That has to be the intent, is to uh, extract from the past information and perspective that will inform our view of the present and the future. That's my lesson today in the Dividend Cafe. I hope it's useful. I encourage any questions or comments you may have, including wondering about how that can be applied to a particular crisis or challenge on your mind, because I've used a few different examples, but I, I could have cherry picked from any place I wanted and you may have other specifics. So reach out, uh, more to come on all of this. Thanks as always for listening to Divin Cafe. Uh, please do subscribe, forward this around, send it, whoever you want. We appreciate your efforts, uh, your help and our efforts to grow the subscriber base with these players um, in the way the podcast world works. Thanks for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe.